5898 Wilkins Avenue. The complainant says they have an active shooter in the building. A second call says they uh, are being attacked. Uh, they have shotguns. 315, every available unit in the city needs to get here now. All units hold a perimeter. We're taking on AK-47 fire from out the uh, front of the synagogue. Good morning, everyone. We have some breaking news out of Squirrel Hill this morning. This is an active shooter situation going uh, on there right now. Gunfire at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Squirrel Hill. There was a staccato coming back at him. Right now, uh, we have multiple casualties. We're working the situation. He said, there's an active shooter at Tree of Life. Officers are involved. Multiple casualties. And I had already said that sounds like it might be gunshots from police that were hearing. However, so I had a cell phone on me, and uh, I was the first call tonight. One more. There are several persons uh, in, in several different places inside. Uh, they're barricaded. And she said, "Dad, I think something's going on in Pittsburgh." And I said, "Nah, not Pittsburgh, not Squirrel Hill." right there. We can't get any closer. We're under fire. 7-1, clear the air. We have a surrender in progress. Uh, suspects crawling out at this time. Clear the air. 7-1, uh, suspects talking about uh, all these Jews need to die. Um, the suspect in the shooting is in custody. We have multiple casualties inside the synagogue. We have three officers who have been shot. This is the Tree of Life Synagogue in the Squirrel Hill section of Pittsburgh. On October 27, 2018, a man armed with a military-style assault rifle burst into this building and shouted anti-Semitic slurs. He opened fire on people peacefully worshiping, just as they had done every Saturday for decades. Eleven congregants died, and six people were injured, including four police officers. It was the deadliest attack on a Jewish community in U.S. history. The 11 people who died here were from three different congregations housed in this building. Tree of Life, or Lasimka, Dor Hadash, and New Light. The assailant, identified as Robert Bowers, shot indiscriminately and exchanged gunfire with police officers before surrendering. One year later, we're looking back at what happened here, at the people who died here, the impact it had on their families, the response by the community, and how it forever changed the city of Pittsburgh. Our story begins in the vibrant neighborhood of Squirrel Hill, home to Pittsburgh's largest Jewish community. On almost any Saturday morning, if you walk down the street uh, say down Shady Avenue or down Murray Avenue, you're going to see people walking to synagogue in several different directions um, because all the different movements of Judaism are represented in some way in this community, in this uh, neighborhood. It's not center city, but it is diverse, uh, welcoming, friendly, and safe. It just has a deep, rich culture that is cultivated by generations of people from all over the world. And it's a community that cares, cares about its own community and gives time and resources to making it the best that it can be, but cares about the greater community and making sure that all of Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania uh, have the things we need in order to build a better, better place. That's what I think of when I think of Squirrel Hill. The Squirrel Hill community, as well as I, the surrounding community of Squirrel Hill, I mean, very caring community. They would call a paramedic or an ambulance, um, and they would be apologizing because they're calling you. Uh, 
and that's you know that's our job. Um, they would thank you uh, from the bottom of their heart. They would make you, you know, weeks later they would come to the station and bring you food. So it's a very close knit, caring community. I lived on um, on a street that was probably in the heart of Squirrel Hill. It was just a great place to grow up. We used to go what we called up street, which was Forbes and Murray. And we'd meet our friends, we'd walk to the supermarket. My parents walked to the supermarket every day. It was, we felt safe. We met our friends, we hung out, went to the movies. I grew up there, I mean, you knew the neighborhood. I walked the streets. I was up at Forbes and Murray. I was playing video games at the Manor Theater. I just, it, it, was, it was a safe community to walk around and meet your friends and everybody was within walking distance and it was just, it was a great community to grow up in. Take it, yeah, just take us to where you, where you parked that day. Judah Samet is an 81-year-old Hungarian-born Holocaust survivor. He was seven years old when he and his family were forced from their home in Hungary and put on a train headed for Auschwitz. They ended up in the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, where Samet nearly starved to death before being liberated in 1945. Judah Samet was in his 20s when he came to the United States and eventually made it to Pittsburgh, where he married his late wife Barbara and became part of the Tree of Life congregation regularly attending services on the Sabbath. What is it like for you to, to see the building like this all these months? It's like losing a home. That's why I don't come by this place much. It's... On October 27th, he arrived late. A man warned him shots were being fired inside. What would have happened if you had gotten here four minutes earlier and been sitting in your usual seat? Well, I would have probably at least I would have probably hit someplace in my body. Now the rabbi was all the way on the other end of the synagogue, and uh, he managed to get three guys who were sitting very close to him. My, a, uh, how should I say, my inkling would be probably to go through the other door in the front. Mm -hmm. But maybe because of the shooting, I would have had to run all the way to the pulpit and by then, maybe he was shooting again. So I had no escape, though, you know? You don't think you would have survived? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. It's not the first time I'm used to it. I'm a professional survivor. <laughs> For survivors like Judah Samet, talking about October 27th is something they feel compelled to do. For others, the emotional wounds make it difficult to discuss what happened that day. What do you remember about that day you you were arriving at tree of life yes and i don't i don't want to go into a lot of detail about that uh, only because um i'm st i'm still going through uh you know trauma counseling um and it's painful so but yes i will just say that that we were just arriving in order to be able to i was going to co-lead a service for with uh, Congregation Dor Hadash. Uh, of, we have been members of that congregation since um, the late 1980s. Um, and so we were arriving there uh, and we heard, uh, we were hearing what sounded like, um, you know, construction work or firecrackers or something. Um, but then only when we had parked and walked near the building did we realize that what we were hearing was gunshots. First thing that's kind of going through my mind is, you know, maybe a domestic or something because we've had shootings uh, at, at churches in the past that were domestic related. And then I turned the radio on and I happened to be on a different channel, uh, channel two, and I heard one of the supervisors saying, "If you ha make sure you have your long guns. And then, then I knew something was, so I switched to the channel and. Uh, drove as fast and as safely as I could from uh, from there to uh, 
uh, to the Tree of Life, to the synagogue. I was in Washington, D.C. celebrating the birthday party, the second birthday party of my grandchild. Um, my daughter uh, happened to hear a uh, next door alert uh, on her, she has an Apple phone, on her phone at 9.50, and she said, Dad, I think something's going on in Pittsburgh. And I said, nah, not Pittsburgh, not Squirrel Hill. That morning, I got the call right around 10 o'clock, um, and I picked up the phone, and uh, Dan was on the other line, and he said, there's an active shooter at Tree of Life. Officers are involved, multiple casualties. And it just all hit me at one time, and I said, give me a minute. And I said, I'll call you right back. And I hung the phone up. Uh, I said a short prayer. And then I just picked the phone up again and I just called him back. And I said, can you come down and get me? And he said, I'm already on the way. So I had a cell phone on me. And um, I was the first call to 911. So I don't know to what degree that impacted the uh, response or not. Uh, that's only conjecture, I would think. but. Uh, so, as an example, I had my cell phone on me. And that made a big difference. Well, you know, you like to think that uh, I was able to get uh, in contact with uh, 911 quickly, as quickly as possible, and was able to um, remain in contact with them. So, you know, you hope that that was of some benefit. How did you maintain your composure as that was happening? I have no idea. I'll, I'll never be able to answer that one. I just recalled some of the things that I had learned in the training sessions and just, just did it without thinking, really. Just quick did it. Is there any way to put into words how frightening that was? No. No, not at all. Um, even if I would try, uh, I think until you really live through something like that, you really then can't understand um, exactly what that's like. No. Words fail, I think, for, for that kind of a description. When did you realize this was an anti-Semitic attack? Can you answer that? I would say that Knowing that an incident was happening in a, in a house of worship, um, that there could have potentially been some type of hatred, hate crime, as we said in the federal, I um, mean, the anti Semitic, I uh, know, and, uh, and I agree with the chief that we'd rather not get into when that definitive decision was made. However, I, I knew going there that there was a potential there. I knew once we arrived on the scene, um, prior to talking to the media, that we knew it was potentially going to be a hate crime. The accused shooter, Robert Bowers, was wounded in an exchange of gunfire with police and brought to Allegheny General Hospital. He was once again shouting anti-Semitic slurs as he was being taken out of the ambulance. He didn't realize the people taking care of him were Jewish, including AGH President Dr. Jeffrey Cohen. As he got off the ambulance, um, he was yelling, you know, we have to kill all the Jews, or words to that effect. Um, so they brought him into a trauma bay to assess him. Uh, the nurse that took care of him was the son of a rabbi. Uh, the, one of the attending physicians is also Jewish. He had no idea about that. Um, he was fine as a patient. Um, he got treated normal process of things that would go on for something of that nature. And at that point, he wasn't the alleged shooter, he was a patient. Inside the Tree of Life, 13 congregants had been shot. Andrea Wedner and her 97-year-old mother, Rose Malinger, were in their usual seats in the back of the sanctuary. Malinger was hit and died not long after. Wedner was shot in the arm and thought she might bleed to death. How did you get out of that building that day? Once he was apprehended, they came in the, in the chapel and they walked around. 
one, one SWAT officer came in, he walked around and I moved. I tried to get up and he said, stay down. And then he came back in with a SWAT medic and he said to come with him. So I got up and I walked out, said goodbye to my mother and walked out. 11 people were killed in the Tree of Life shooting. Rose Mallinger, mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother, who once served as school secretary at Tree of Life and was described as a fixture of the congregation. Richard Godfried, a dentist who did charity work seeing patients who could not otherwise afford dental care. Melvin Wax, a retired accountant, remembered as a kind man and a pillar of the New Light congregation. Joyce Feinberg, a researcher at the University of Pittsburgh's Learning Research and Development Center. Jerry Rabinowitz, a physician described as a trusted confidant and healer. Cecil and David Rosenthal, Brothers from Squirrel Hill, remembered as men who had a love for life and those around them. Sylvan and Bernice Simon, who were married at the Tree of Life Synagogue in 1956. Irving Younger, a one-time real estate company owner described as a wonderful father and grandfather. And Daniel Stein, a leader in the New Light congregation and a visible member of Pittsburgh's Jewish community. What can you tell me about Rose and the kind of person she was? Rose was one special lady. She was 97 years old and she loved life. People were shocked. I take her to the doctor and they just couldn't believe she was, you know, the nurses couldn't believe she was 97 years old. She was funny. She was witty. She was cute. Everyone used to say how cute she was. She was this little old lady with a cane and uh, she was, uh, she loved life. She loved being with people. She loved her family. She loved being with her family. She loved taking her family out to dinner. She, um, she was a very positive person. You know, at 97, you think, you know, how much more do I have to go? And she would make comments every now and then, yeah, if I'm here to see it or this and that. But she, for the most part, she was very positive and she just loved her children, her grandchildren, and her great-grandchild. Anyone who knew her loved her, and people would see us out, and we were, we were uh, spottable because we were always together, so it was, uh, was kind of nice. But uh, never, there was never a negative word said about Rose Malinger. Tell me about Cecil and David and the kind of guys they were. Cecil was... Um, Cecil was the outgoing one. He was, as people would describe him, the mayor of Squirrel Hill. Uh, knew everybody, knew everybody's business uh, when they were getting married, if they got divorced. Everybody loved Cecil and everybody knew Cecil. David, on the other hand, was the quieter one. Uh, David didn't like attention didn't like the limelight like Cecil did. David loved and was mesmerized since he was a child by the firemen. Uh, so he spent, and policemen, so he spent a lot of time at the firehouse um, and the police station on Northumberland, which is, is the station that responded to everything. And uh, he was just the quieter one. But they were both just, they were always happy. They didn't, they weren't mean, they weren't sad, they were just, they were beautiful people. Being special needs, at, my parents had my brothers at a time when a lot of families might have been institutionalizing their kids and my parents didn't do that. They raised them, they were part of our family and I have such respect for my parents um, for doing that and uh, Just, my brothers were part of our family. They weren't different. They were, they were part of the community. And so I think that's why it even made the community um, embrace them a little easier. In the Dorf Adash congregation, uh, Jerry Rabinowitz was, um, was the, uh, the person whom we lost. And, and he was a, a great friend to people. His, he was helping his whole, as a, as a physician, his 
whole focus was to help people, um, and he fulfilled that every day of his life. And um, he was at the synagogue because he was helping get ready for the service, which is what he often did. And, you know, so in a sense for me, and for, I think for a lot of people, the unfairness, the unfairness of having those folks be the ones who were lost, who were attacked and lost. Um, and the rest of us, people who were near enough by to hear the shots that killed them, the people who were needing to, uh, wanting to come and then were turned away, couldn't. Um, it's, the, it's this, it's this, again, the word that comes to my mind right now, where I am, you know, sort of 10 months since the, uh, since the events, is the, just sort of like the, the cosmic unfairness of it all. Not allowing these folks to live out their lives um, in, a, in, a, in a dignified and, and fruitful way. Pam Glazer was a neighbor of Sylvan and Bernice Simon. They walk their dogs together almost every day. When I'm alone in the car and I pass here, you know, I say a little bit, a little prayer that they're, that they're resting and that they're at peace. These days, when Pam walks by their house, she still can't believe Sylvan and Bernice are gone. They were kind of opposites. She was just a, a picture of health, and he was kind of in his tie-dyed shirt, uh, jolly and paid, made people laugh. And it was just a part of Beacon Hill that I will never forget. How much do you miss them? I miss them every day because when I drive past, I still expect them to come out of there. And they don't come out. So of the 11 people that died, uh, I knew a lot of them. Um, you would see them at services. Um, and it just, it's hard to believe that this could happen at your front door. And it makes you step back and think about what's going on. So yeah, we were married there in 1985. Um, we had four bar, two bar, two bat was there. Family events, holidays, um, funerals, um, you know, it's just part of your community. And, you know, right down the street, St. Beats, that's as much as part of the community here as Tree of Life, as is Forbes and Murray. It's the neighborhood. It's where people live. And the idea that in Sleepy Squirrel Hill, this would happen. Tell me about Joyce Feinberg. What kind of a woman was she? What kind of a mom was she? Wow, well, um, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, she was, well, this is coming from her son, and, and my brother would say the same thing. Uh, just a, a wonderful mom, but that, everyone says that about their mom, uh, or most people will say that about their mom, so I, I think the, the real litmus test is what other people say about their mom. Uh, so if you look at my wife, only known my mother for, for, for 20 years, uh, well only, it's still a significant amount of time. Uh, she would just be in awe at her kindness, which is a value that was uh, repeated when other people were talking and, 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 and saying what we praise about uh, my mother. But we were very lucky to have lots of friends and family reach out to not sing praise, but to communicate the uh, enormous loss that they felt. Obviously not comparable, but that uh, the, 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 the contribution that they felt to their lives from what our mother was able to contribute to them, so. How much do you miss your mom? Can't measure it, you can't measure it. It's not possible. You say that you tried to pray that day, but that you couldn't. Why? When I really experienced 
the sense of not being able to pray was the following first thing in the morning, the following morning, because I have a morning prayer practice. And that was when I was trying to do this and realizing that I really couldn't. And thinking, wow, this is... Uh, that, that's when I personally began to like put it together that not only were other people, the people that I was attempting to comfort and to be with and help walk through this difficult time, this terrible time, but that I too was really strongly affected because normally um, I have a, a pretty uh, pretty open line to, um, to, you know, sort of the, the holy universe and it really felt shut at, at that moment. It was not a feeling that I had ever had before. Did it shake your faith? No. Uh -uh. It didn't shake my faith. It, sh it shook my sense of, of ability to, to access it, <laughs> in a way. So. What did you do instead? I think I prayed the prayer I could pray, which was, I need help. You know, I've almost 40 years in, in public safety, um, 25 with the federal government, um, you know, and I've been through crime scenes throughout the United States, and, but it's especially hard in your hometown, you know, being born and raised in Pittsburgh and knowing, knowing what the officers, what the first responders went through, knowing people that had loved ones in that synagogue, um, it's, it's very difficult. What kind of a toll did this take on your staff, and particularly the members of the staff, like the nurse, who were Jewish? It had a profound effect on the entire staff. I've never seen anything like it. Um, on Monday I walked in, a number of people that walked up to me and said, Dr. Cohen, we're really sorry about what happened, literally crying. And um, I was struck by everybody that I saw. Um, felt they had, it was mass mourning is what it was. So I called up um, two of our psychiatrists. I said, you know, I don't know what, what mass mourning looks like, but I think I'm seeing it. You guys got to get out there and start dealing with this because the whole staff has been affected by this. So that Monday morning, they transferred him to a jail from AGH. Um, and we actually had uh, sessions, therapy sessions, available to anyone that needed it. And then we had programs that we put on where people got up and talked about it. But it had a profound effect on the staff. What happened here was, as horrible as that event was, the good that came from the community was so much greater. And being a witness to it all, you know, Allegheny got the shooter. They stood up and they did the right thing. They treated him like a patient, not as, you know, an assailant of uh, innocent people. Do you find yourself ever dealing with survivor's guilt? Initially, for a bit, I did. But I came to learn and understand that uh, there was nothing I could have really done. Um, I did whatever little bit that I could do, but no, there wasn't. But I've come to understand that apparently God wanted me to be in Pittsburgh for some reason. And um, my faith um, strengthens me to continue to move on day by day. That uh, there's some divine plan and that uh, God literally said to me, Jeffrey, no, it's not your turn yet. Uh, I got stuff I need you to do. You know, how do you react to an event like this? And I think the first principle is to ensure that every single person who is impacted by the event directly have the ability to, to be able to talk to somebody. Because the pain lives inside. And the only way to get it out is by talking. And the longer you hold it in, the worse it becomes. It's been a year that 
in some regards, d defies description because there's nothing that can prepare you um, for October 27th and then everything that's happened ever since. Um, so in some regard, it, sometimes words escape me for how you, how do you explain it, particularly uh, if people have never lived through an experience like that. Um, but alas, there are many people, more and more, who, who are living through these experiences and um, it's kind of like we get each other because we've lived through it, we understand um, what it's all about and there's this, I guess, built-in camaraderie. What's the past year been like for you? It's been awful and it's been wonderful. Uh, awful because of what happened, but wonderful because there's a lot of good has come out of it. We've, we've made a lot of, built a lot of new relationships and uh, we, we've seen a lot of kindness in people and we are kinder to people and um, we just want to move forward and, and live our life in a positive way. City leaders, all Pittsburgh natives, shared in the collective trauma that resulted from the October 27th attack. Along with members of the community, they have been grappling with the question of what is the best way for the city and its people to heal and go forward. What big idea do you have for dealing with the social poisons of hatred and anti-Semitism? It's difficult because I do believe that the Constitution needs to be followed in the strictest terms, especially when it comes to the First Amendment. But at the same time, logic dictates that hate speech brings about violence, that hate speech leads to actions by those who express it with no type of any common sense. And on one side, you never want to live in a society where speech is limited, but on the other side, it's a very real consequence of living in a society where speech is not limited, that some people will hear that speech be poisoned by that speech, and then carry out actions like this because of that speech. Well, to me, part of my mission has become um, a response to, as, as I've called it, H speech, the, the word hate, which I, I say is a four-letter uh, obscenity, and uh, uh, I put it in the, in the trash basket in my brain. Uh, I don't use it. Uh, I think that our language in America has become way too severe, uh, way too uncivilized and we need to tone it down because when we don't tone down our language we then get more emotional when we speak and these emotions lead to violence such as what happened in the Tree of Life on October 27th. Mr. Bowers is still alive. Bernice and Sylvan are dead. He's still alive sitting in jail and for what reason? They should have taken him that day. How do you counsel someone who feels hatred toward Robert Bowers, the accused shooter? I wouldn't say that there'd be, shall we say, one specific approach because no two people are the same. Um, but that being said, H caused this, um, that's not the cure. If you think, if you recall the days in math when you learned about negative numbers, you know, the only way to um, get rid of a negative number is not by adding another negative number, it's by adding a positive number so you get closer to zero. Well, the same thing with, with, with H speech. If you just throw more in, that just makes it worse. That doesn't make it better. Children need to be taught correctly that hate speech is not acceptable that people, children need to be taught to love one another. People need to be taught to love one another. You have to see the good in people and not the bad. And people are different. Everybody's different. Even if we look alike, we're different. 
And you have to accept that in people. People need to be more tolerant and kind and loving. You don't have to love everybody, but you, you just have to be more tolerant of people and see people for who they are inside and, and not how they look or what they're wearing or what they believe. When the shootings at the Tree of Life Synagogue happened, there were people who said that they thought something like this would never happen in the city of Pittsburgh. Has the city of Pittsburgh changed? And if so, how does it feel different after what happened a year ago? Um, I don't know. It's sort of like, yes, it's changed and it will never be the same. And at the same time, uh, Pittsburgh showed off its best character and in doing so, uh, proved itself to be resilient. What would you like to see happen to that building? What is your wish? Well, for certain, uh, we must reopen. Um, reopening says to the congregation and to the rest of the world that um, evil will not win. Uh, it will not chase us out of our building. So uh, we must reopen and we will. Um, to me, I, I want to have the day that we reopen be one where people can look at what we've accomplished and go, wow, that's just incredible. And the wow is not about what it may look like, but it's about the fact that the steps we've been able to take um, in the healing process so that people can go, that's just incredible what they've been able to achieve. I will tell you it's going to be hard for me to go back in that building knowing what happened. Something should be done to commemorate that site uh, to the people that A, passed away, and B, how the community rallied to the aid of the Jewish community when it was threatened. Yeah, we'll always be different. We'll always have this memory of the darkest day of Pittsburgh's history in our mind, but we won't let it change us. I think the most important thing I've come to learn is that, that I'll never be healed, nor will we be healed in the past tense, it will be healing. It will always be a, a state where we're continually going through. So there's a core set of decency that exists here um, that's very hard to shatter. And uh, Mr. Bowers did not do that. I had one goal, which was to try to look forward and, and consider what was going forward. So, again, is the, is, is the, if you'll allow me, is the cup half full or half empty? And I try to look at it and say the cup's half full. This could have been anywhere. It just happened to be here, and they should never be forgotten. My mother will never be forgotten, and they should never be forgotten. They, this story needs to be told for a long time and people need to know who these 11 people were.